We've had two and a half billion views of our digital content in the last four years. It dwarfs everything else that we do. I think Triple J has done an extraordinary job over a long period of time. They are completely and utterly focused on their audience. These audiences are savvy. They know when they're being marketed to or advertised to. I think it boils down to three questions. Who are your audience? Where are they spending their time? And are you capturing their attention? One way to differentiate or make a distinction between a celebrity, someone who's, cross, someone who's in the mainstream, and an influencer, is that a celebrity has a one-to-many relationship, whereas an influencer has a one-to-one -one relationship with many. And as a brand, that's quite interesting. I think five years ago when I started working with them, it was every kid's dream to get on Neighbours or Home and Away and, and have that legitimacy because you'd made it. That's changing. And as that's changing, I'm also seeing that attitude um, of the social talent I work with change, definitely. You know, they, they get TV offers, they get offers to come on the radio and they say, well, wait, why would I spend six months working on this TV show when I could be building my own businesses and building my own content and starting my own production company and creating exactly what I want to create, you know, where their audience isn't there for me anymore. My fans don't really care about seeing me there. We're probably taking a slightly different lens. Occasionally we're working with sort of YouTube creators per se, like uh, the Bondi hipsters. But at the same time, looking at how we can drag sort of what we would call a traditional celebrity back into kind of a YouTube-esque environment. Um, and we've been playing with some stuff with uh, Ricky Gervais. We had scripts and everything, and he, um, on the morning of the shoot, just put a red pen through it and said, I'd like to do it like this. Um, Optus, approached me and asked me to do an advert telling Australia that they're getting Netflix. I said, I'd need like a shed load of cash, like seriously mental money. They went, okay. Well, I think, I think the challenge has been just giving up creative control. At Coca-Cola Australia, we, we, the way in which we work with, with influencers is you recognise that they've built their success on an innate knowledge of what works for their audience. So you're, that's what you're tapping into. I mean, we, we as brands like to have control and in this new world, you need to release a little bit of that control. I think one of the worst things that I see as a manager is brands not taking that strategic and considered approach and just reaching out campaign by campaign. Oh, you know, these people have a million subscribers. We can reach their audience there. Per mm. Let's work with them. If it is a genuine partnership, mm. you're authentically conveying this message to your audience as the influencer. Like, you know, I'm partnered with Coke. I'm partnered with Optus. The audience knows that. I, I deal with brands from in a traditional media sense. Mm. And I'm not sure they're that far planned to have that conversation. I don't think a majority of brands think like that. I mean, the, the, yeah. the, the briefs that I see come through short term, how can I kick this goal right now? So I think you're both right. I think you're absolutely right. And certainly we, we also have an element of short termism. You know, yeah. so we're very focused on campaigns. Mm -hmm. But I mean, there's some very smart people in our organisation who are trying to buck that trend. You know, again, five or six years ago, you saw, or what I saw was a lot of YouTubers that would do these brand deals as such. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they'd sort of try and weave in this messaging and they'd be very, very subtle to the point of deceiving their audience and that they were being paid for it. And now, you know, I, at least with my car, my clients, I encourage them to talk about the fact they're working with the brand, to talk about that relationship, course, yeah. partner with them because, mm -hmm. These audiences are savvy, mm. you know, they are savvy. They know when they're being marketed to or advertised to, but they're happy to engage in something that they think's relevant for them, you know, content. Mm. I mean, look, we're a traditional business. However you look at it, we are fundamentally a traditional brand. We've been picking individuals who maybe we can find a genuine interest with them. So, and it sounds like a Rolodex, a celebrity now, I don't mean it like this, but with Mark Wahlberg, he was, talking about small business because he owns actually a bunch of small businesses that, yeah. are, that are increasingly successful. And he's one of HBO's top producers, yeah. so he's a small businessman. So just finding different angles in, otherwise it is pretty unsophisticated, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. I actually had a 
um, condom company approached me about, we want to reach teenagers. We want to speak to them and we don't want to, you know, plug them condoms, but we want to talk to them about safe sex. We collectively came up with, um, with one of my clients, Troy, Savan came up with an idea of awkward conversations with Troy. The best thing about that campaign was, you know, he, in every video he spoke to the fact that he was working with Durex, he teamed up with them. And his audience was responding, thank you so much. Thank you so much for this information. Thank you for talking to us about that. And then Durex would build resources yeah. around those topics that Troy was talking about. But they did it in a way that I think actually provided really valuable information to that audience of young people through someone they trusted, like Troy. And I just think it was a really great campaign. All of that is exactly what we've been talking about today in terms of how do you do this stuff properly? You know, that goes into that authenticity yeah. sort of area. From a brand point of view, if I was if I was one of these YouTuber, I would be like using my platform to go now. Who can I use to take like, under my you, wing? You can't, you can't actually do that because the thing is, is YouTube's such a creative, it's a inheritably a creative output, right? So mm. sometimes, you know, as a manager, it's very tempting to go, well, you know, I look after this person, I look after this person, you guys should, you know, cross promote, you should collaborate. Yeah. But yeah. then you get the two of them in a room together and there's just nothing there. I find the best collaborations aren't happening necessarily too strategically, but it's like, it's you know, thing, yeah. it's, or, it's organic. Yeah. And growing up in New Zealand, there were 60 million sheep, but there were only two TV channels. The distribution of messaging and therefore content was pretty narrow. And now it's so eclectic. And I don't think it's necessarily a case of doing anything fundamentally different. I just think um, it's kind of easier to find what you want. You know, I've got personal interests and if someone's talking about it intelligently, I'll gravitate towards that person, whether or not they're an endorsed known individual. I'll listen to them. Um, and that in itself is an endorsement in terms of human behaviour, which is I don't need a third party telling me that that person is good or not. And I think that's been the big change. And as a result, people creating content, people just frankly being creative, um, are embraced across a much broader spectrum. In my mind, for my creators coming up now, yeah. I don't care which platform they're aiming for. It doesn't really matter as long as they're creating content, as long as they're connecting with noise. The level of creativity that comes out of Australia is, is on another level. Yeah.